Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are at. Hopefully you're enjoying Power BI days today. Jan, uh, you know that feeling you get whenever you press publish and you're really excited to kind of hear that feedback from your end user or maybe your client, and then you open up that email or kind of that instant message and you see it's not quite what I was expecting or we had missed oh. the mark on this one. Yeah, I yeah, I know. It's my own report. It was painfully slow, difficult to navigate. I will never use those features. I was thinking maybe something a little bit like before, or uh, I didn't really want you to change the way it's always been done. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> I that, think many of the people know that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's that feeling of heartbreak whenever you read, it's not you, it's, uh, it's your data model. Yeah. Well, now that I've told you I am out here making terrible data models, maybe I should introduce myself and we can talk through about how we can kind of correct some of these situations. So my name is Alex Powers. I'm a Microsoft Certified Solutions Associate in Business Intelligence Reporting, MTA in Python, Microsoft Office Expert in Excel, Microsoft Office Specialist in Excel and Access, Microsoft Office, or I'm sorry, Microsoft How We Excel Contest winner, co-organizer of the St. Louis Power BI user group, hashtag STLPBIUG. If you couldn't tell by now, I am definitely going long on my investment in Microsoft technologies. Uh, a bit of a millennial whisperer and trainer for my website. It's not about the sell.com. Uh, confused by the term pair of socks. Uh, I don't want to derail the entire conversation, but it's kind of weird. A pair means two and socks means two with the plural. So that means four socks. Still trying to wrap my head around that one. And uh, just bad at Fortnite. Uh, I kind of squatted up with my little cousin. They called me a noob. And I uninstalled the game very shortly after. So I lived a very short life here as an esports gamer. But let's talk about that data model. And it comes down to that user experience as a report developer. So user experience refers to a person's emotions and attitudes about using a product system or service. In this example, it'll be obviously Power BI and the Power BI service. Uh, it really deals with the perception. It's building that trust with the end user of, is it easy to use? Is it efficient? And what is the actual utility of this? What is the questions that we are answering with our data models? Today's objectives are actually gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, we're gonna concentrate on that readability, just allowing for discovery with our end users, uh, performance considerations. So really kind of hitting home on that efficiency and then ultimately building the trust with our end users that they can learn more uh, kind of within the new features coming down the pipelines here. So with that, first thing I want you to do, clean that underscore up, field names. I'm talking about the devs and DBAs in today's session. I know you are out there using your Camel case, your Pascal case, or even your Snake cases. Uh, it can be somewhat of a painful experience kind of double clicking on each field name from left to right. I completely get it, I'm there with you, but we are concentrating on the end user. How easy is it for them to be able to start doing data discovery? Now I know this isn't the fun part of the Power BI experience. No one is gonna send you an email saying a great job on the column headers, you really knocked it out of the park on this one, but this is going that extra mile that we were kind of talking about. So with that, I'm gonna jump over to the Power BI desktop application, and we have our field names here. I'm gonna go ahead and right click, I'm gonna do expand all, and these probably look a little familiar. And then Jan, if you could let me know that that zoomed in properly. Um, it zoomed in a bit, I think. I, I can read it at least. All right, excellent. And in these examples, we kind of see here just a typical uh, database layout. So it'll be just kind of the uh, capital letters, underscore, since spaces are reserved character, and then uh, just kind of the next character in line here. And then we also have our sales orders. This is our Pascal case where it'll just be uh, kind of capital letter, next capital letter on the next word, next capital letter. So let's go ahead and see what we can do kind of make this a little bit more efficient. So we're gonna go into our edit queries. Customer names here. And we're actually gonna do an FX. So we're gonna add step. I'm gonna zoom in here for us. So we're gonna do table. So this, this is a table object. Transform column names. Awesome. 
So it'll be our source, this is our previous step. And we're gonna do each, so for each item in our collection here of our headers, we're gonna do a replacer, dot replace text. We're gonna do an underscore, because we're not going to hard code in the values. This way it'll just iterate from kind of left to right each item within that collection. So that's our each statement. We're gonna remove the underscore, comma, replace it with a space. Go ahead and close that out. You know, let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Much cleaner. But, you know, I don't want to be yelling at people all the time here with the capitalization. So let's wrap this with a text.proper. And we'll close that out here once again. Customer name, customer city. We didn't have to click on each field from left to right and rename these manually. We can just do this one time here with the transform column names. Let's try this with that Pascal case though. This might be a little bit more difficult because we don't actually have any delimiters in this example. So maybe we can just double click in here, hit space, hit space, that we're gonna take up the entire hour with this if we go this method right. So let's actually delete this and let's try something else again. So FX, we're gonna go back to our table, dot transform column names. If you guys are not excited about IntelliSense like me, you are uh, you are painfully missing out because it was it was not fun even a, a week or two ago doing these. And we're gonna actually do a splitter this time. That split text by character transition. And what is our character transition? So this is gonna be the first argument is gonna be uh, kind of at each. So we're gonna do a list. So a dot dot through z lowercase right and then anytime it comes to a capital a through zz i want to go ahead and split and once again we're using the underscore here within our each so in that way we are not defining whatever these column headers are with the hard-coded value and if we go ahead and press enter so we cannot current value list to type text all right, so we actually have to wrap this now with the text function because we had returned a, a split list. So we're gonna do text.combine. And let me go and make sure we got that here. Jump in the advanced editor. So it's a little bit more difficult to read the formula bar. One of the exciting announcements coming out is that next, or within a couple weeks here, the uh, there will be an M formula editor. And let me take one last look here. Did I miss something? Splitter, split by character transitions. Oh, there it is. One extra. Life of a coder, right? So just with that, we didn't have to double click on each header. We we're able to easily make this into a, a readable format. So just with a proper casing and a space. So looking at the previous step, we had no spacing, increased readability right there. So sales orders, and then obviously with our table names, we wanna kind of go back to that. So customer names, just add a space. That's all I'm asking. And then we'll do a close and apply. Take a look here on our right-hand side. We'll see what the readability kind of improvements are. and have a named expression. Doing apply changes here again. There we go. And I will post this code out on GitHub as well. Uh, 
definitely just kind of encourage you to just add it in any of your data models that currently exist. I, I do not want you taking a long way around here with rename steps. So right there, we have kind of increased the readability of our field names. Let's jump back into our presentation though, because now I'd like to talk about performance. Performance beats pretty 100% of the time, 50% uh, of the time. What does that mean? It means we're gonna talk about kind of the X velocity engine and what's going on behind the curtain. So run length encoding, and then also the auto sort kind of discuss that you can get kicked out of your own party. And then we'll also look at segmentation, compression, and then obviously just the overall memory consumption of your data model. So the X velocity engine is actually split into two different kind of encodings. So we have our dictionary encoding, then we also have our column encoding. Taking a look at our example here, we just have a simple table of colors and values. So we have red, blue, green, green, yellow, yellow, et cetera. What the dictionary does is it goes through and it finds the cardinality, so the unique elements here. So within our colors, we now have encoded red as zero, one as blue, two is green, etc. And then within our table, anytime that this, uh, this kind of unique pattern is found, it will then encode that just as a column encoding. It will then remove that kind of dictionary, so now the value scans will just be the ID, and our value, and then our dictionary will still remain the same. And then from there, it'll go through an evaluation process, finding each one of these values. So if we were to jump back over to our Power BI, we can kind of see this in action. So we're gonna see the uniqueness of our colors come through and then just of our uh, values here within a sum. Let me go and fire that up for us. And then I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret here in terms of the uh, the X velocity and, or Vertipack engine, whichever way you prefer calling it, uh, just kind of internal naming. All it is is a select distinct and a select from. That is the complete magic. So if we were to look here, we now have our red, blue, green, green, yellow, yellow. So we do see that we have duplicates. If I was to drop this onto our canvas now, so I'm gonna drop in color. we can see that it, all it is returning is those distinct values that we saw. It's not showing any duplication. So that is our dictionary uh, that has been created. And then if we drop in value, it'll then go through that aggregation process. And so this is just our sum, so our column encoding. And this process is actually called run length encoding. So it finds that pattern between each uh, kind of unique item here within the table. So if we're to add more dimensions, obviously our uniqueness does change so take a look back here. I, I'd actually mentioned auto sort, but we didn't really see that or we didn't talk about it because this is very expensive having to sort through and find each pattern. So what is it actually doing is it's actually optimally sorting your data model upon being loaded. Uh, if you want to roll the dice and you think that you, have, you can beat the engine sort patterns, I mean, feel free to go for it. It's something we're testing out, but it does an incredible job. Uh, finding that optimal pattern. So if you notice now, it's not looking and scanning for each item in the list. It says here's zero and here's one, here's where two starts. And this process is called run length encoding. So it'll choose the start value. So red starts at one, it has three values contained. Blue then starts at position four, it contains two, green at six, two, yellow eight, two, purple 10, one, and orange at 11 with one. Now, if we were to look at this scan now, much cleaner. It doesn't have to spend as much time kind of looking for each value at the row level, which is why, once again, uh, kind of looking at the run length encoding and the sort order of your data model is extremely important when discussing cardinality. So with that, Let's talk about how you can get kicked out of your own party. Cardinality, 
high cardinality are columns with values that are very uncommon or unique. So these will be your date times, or if you have IDs that you're importing into your table that are not needed for relationships. I mean, if you absolutely need them for a relationship, definitely bring them in. Uh, text fields, these are your kind of your free form fields. So think of maybe like a survey response or just anything that is not standardized. Um, this isn't meaning, you know, if you have a product SKU or a description, they shouldn't bring it in. I mean, definitely bring those in as those will continue to be repeated. Uh, but just anything where kind of the end user, kind of the the columns that you're bringing in do have that ability to have <laughs> absolute no uniqueness. And then uh, obviously our numbers for floating point precision. So if you have a 15 point uh, decimal here being imported in the data model, that'll be very expensive because there is not very much uniqueness. So what is the adverse of this? Obviously it's our cardinality, uh, kind of here with the low cardinality, it's columns with relatively few unique values. These could be our dates. Now I, I know you're thinking, well, you know, dates are kind of uncommon or unique, you know, they can go on. I mean, there's only 365 days a year. Even if we were going back 10 years, it's only 3,650. That's not a lot of actual values, completely fine. But that is a continuous series, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, time though, time is only from, you know, one to 86,400 seconds. That has a finite end. So it's always kind of a, a good use case is to split your date and times. And then your true and false, which obviously just be a kind of a one or zero or zero and negative one, whichever kind of program you're coming from. And then obviously currency data types where it's just four digits after the decimal. Yeah, there might be a little bit of a kind of uncommon values, but you should see a lot of repeats, especially when you're not dealing with kind of the, the 15 point precision. So let's jump into just taking a quick look here at a date time series and then a date and time series. Just be one moment. One of these days, a splash screen will be fast. Cool. All right, so in this example, we have our date time value, and we're just doing it at a second level of granularity. So in this model, we actually have 8,900,000 rows. If we were to go and take a look at our date and time series, we have split our values from date into a time. Exact same numbers, and then we have actually increased kind of the uh, kind of the total count of our values. So this one actually contains 88,743,740. So if we were to take a look here now at uh, some tools in which you can start analyzing your data model. First thing, get DAX Studio, if you've not already downloaded it. Highly recommended. And then the other tool in which you'll need is going to be the VertiPack Analyzer. Uh, VertiPack Analyzer, it sounds cool. Uh, really all it is is an Excel workbook. Very helpful though. Uh, hopefully at some point they might make a kind of a version for Power BI desktop, but we'll kind of see if that if that comes to fruition. But with DAX Studio now, I'm gonna go and open that. I have my data model open and I'm gonna go ahead and close our file along now, get some of my resources back from my computer. On the splash screen here, when thing connect, go up to Power BI SSDT, and I'm gonna go to date time series, press connect, awesome. And then in the bottom left-hand corner here, we have our local host. 49982, just go ahead and kind of zoom in here for us. So I'm gonna need that 49982. Jumping over to Excel now, <clears throat> and this is our uh, VertiPack analyzer. We can see here in just kind of their demo, uh, they have rows and cardinality. 
So once again, there is low to no cardinality. This one is exactly the same. Uh, here's a pretty good performance. Uh, so you have 12 million values. The cardinality is 426. This one's even better uh, kind of quantity. Only four kind of unique values. And if we were to go, actually, I'm sorry, four uh, non-unique values. So in this example, we're gonna go to Power Pivot. We're gonna go to Manage. Four nine nine eight two. Cool. Power Pivot is now open. We're gonna to go to existing connections right here. SSAS localhost. Remember, I'm not on this port. And why do we have to do this? Um, kind of every time that you open up Power BI's, it's actually just spinning up a local host of a analysis service engine uh, on your desktop. And then it just assigns a port at random. So anytime you're kind of doing this, um, it's only good for that one, one use. Otherwise, you would just have to go in here and update the connection string. So we're going to do a test connection now. Test succeeded, save. Let's do a quick refresh. Refresh in progress. Shouldn't be too bad here for us. And if you are not subscribed to uh, the SQLBI.com gospel, I, I definitely recommend doing so. These, uh, the Italians are phenomenal in kind of their approach to not only reviewing your data models, but also just the tools in which they've kind of extended to the community are very, uh, kind of very rich and free. Free is always nice. Awesome, success. Go and press close. We now have our data model here, ready for analysis. So our order date, so that was our field that we wanted. I'm just actually do a filter, key point selected items. If we look here, there's no uniqueness. It is the exact number of uh, rows. Very expensive. Consumes 99.98% of our database's size. Uh, so if I was to actually take a look here though, I just kind of preloaded the date and time split. Awesome. Order date, order time. 103, 86,400. The compression is fantastic. So let's kind of go through here and show that here. So 85 different segments, uh, kind of alluding back to kind of the segmentation of the engine. Partitions, it just loads it into one partition kind of within the final model. And jumping back to our slide, how much did you actually save by splitting your column values? From segmentation and compression. Uh, to answer that, we really need to kind of understand what is the actual underlying process. Within Power BI and Power Pivot for Excel, it compresses at 1 million partitions uh, within the scan. Each one of those is running concurrently with the memory in storage. So after it's compressed that 1 million, it'll just kind of continue to block that. <clears throat> so one compressed segment kind of in parallel with the next scan of a million records, continue to compress, continue to compress. At the very end, all of those compressed segments will be pushed into your data model just by your CPU into your data model. And I want to kind of point out here, uh, kind of some of the things that are living within your data model will be your hierarchies, your calculated columns, which I want you to kind of put a star next to that, and then your relationships. If you think about the process and the calculated columns, that is post compression. That means that any unique sorting, uh, kind of the run length encoding, all of that is done afterwards. So you're actually losing some of the advantages of the engine. 
Uh, with that, I would definitely recommend pushing kind of any type of aggregation that you're needing uh, kind of either back closer to the source, if it's SQL Server, or if it needs to be done in Power Query. Uh, just kind of be cognizant that Power Query could be a little bit slow if it, if it is a large range. <laughs> and then obviously take advantage of the X iterator functions uh, within DAX. Know your limits though. Uh, I mean, if you're doing a 300 million record table and you're doing a X iterator that could be very expensive or slow. So consider the performance times. So what were some of the benefits though that we saw from splitting our columns? Compression. On the left, I have my date time series, which results in 91.6 megabytes at 8,900,000 rows. There was no, uh, it, it was a very high cardinality. If we look at the date and time series properties, I have 88 million rows. It only came out to 16.8 megabytes. That was through our compression. Looking at the uniqueness of our items, splitting our date and time. We actually created more data, but it was able to compress down to a, a lower level of a kind of granularity and uniqueness. Takeaways, only bring in what is absolutely needed. I, I can't stress this enough, especially uh, kind of within your data models. It's always easier to add than it is to take away. Knowing that you can see the benefits of kind of compression, uh, just answering the questions that are needed within the data model, from there start evaluating either through the analyzer to take a look and see what are kind of your most expensive columns. Uh, if they're not needed, remove them. That is my, my best advice for you right now. Date and time, bad. Time is the best example. It has a finite series of uh, 86,400 seconds. A very, a very low ceiling. If you absolutely positively must need it in your data model for some type of calculation, I understand. You know, go ahead and leave it. In calculated columns, these are kind of our post-compression aspects. Uh, the closer you can push it towards the source, the better off the performance of your reports will be. I, I cannot stress that enough. I know a lot of people uh, kind of enjoy the add column feature within the desktop application. Just look and see how expensive it could be though. And also reviewing with the uh, Vertipak analyzer, what is the cardinality of the elements? Um, in this, the data size of that dictionary that is now being created. <clears throat> Let's jump over to switch uh, true your battles. Choose your battles. I want you to start thinking more about the end use of your users. So I want you to be cautious with kind of the preview features, uh, especially you know every month there's a new Power BI report. Uh, kind of enhancements that are being kind of sent out through the desktop application. I think a lot of us probably got in trouble whenever we were doing the composite models and we were starting to upload and then realized that we couldn't. That that was a very difficult, uh, you know, design time whenever you see new cool features and you can't use them. I would always recommend wait until they come out of general availability before you actually start pushing them out to your annual audience. Don't assume your audience can't learn. Uh, this kind of goes back to a lot of people who are kind of cautious saying, well, we're not ready yet. We're not there yet. Add one or two new features. Start with end users. They have the most powerful computer in their hands, and that is their mobile phone. They're able to thumb through that all the time, figure out new applications, games. They have the capability to learn. Consistency, consistency, and consistency. Uh, I would always recommend find a practice that works for you within your data models and try and replicate as much as possible. And what does that come back to? It means that you are now establishing a pattern in which people recognize features or enhancements to your data models or your reports. Uh, from there, they will start doing that exploratory processes, uh, you know, clicking on buttons or pop-ups and seeing kind of what comes to be. And also, I don't need to risk your brand uh, kind of over someone else's need for a pie chart. 
I know there's a lot of cool new visuals, but at the end of the day, if the end user and kind of the data visualization and storytelling that they're uh, kind of the that they need is a simple line bar or a pie chart, just build that for them. Data storytelling is a skill, uh, and that is something that is continuing to be kind of enforced within the organizations now is that they, pe people need to be better at telling stories with data. But don't try and overcomplicate the story. And at the end of the day, I want you to champion modern analytics within your organization. So what are we talking about with modern analytics? I'm talking about kind of that natural language querying, synonyms, uh, any type of voice recognition as well. Just kind of using a stat here, uh, Gartner had estimated that by 2020, so this is less than a year away, 50% of analytical queries will be generated via search, natural language processing, or voice. That's an important stat to kind of think about here when we start deploying to our end users. Uh, with that, I want to kind of jump into kind of championing that modern analytics experience and how you can take the next step. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of these here real quick. And then we'll open up kind of our final sales demo. Awesome. So we have our fields. You know, let's go and expand these. Uh, a good recommendation, kind of the exploratory. Here in our view tab, we can go to our field properties. And then we have this description. This will appear in tooltips when you hover over the field. So maybe let's do is a salesperson. Uh, and we'll type in a description. Describes if a person is a sales member in our organization. So now if I was to hover above, is a salesperson. You can add descriptions to your fields. And these will also be available within the Power BI service. So whenever you start uploading these uh, to the online, this way people actually know kind of whatever they're hovering above. A little bit of a description here of what that field means or if there was any type of calculation methodology you want to include, you know, feel free to add that as well. Synonyms. So I'm going to go to our modeling tab now. Uh, I actually don't like kind of the new experience. Uh, it kind of bummed me out when they when they had changed it. So let me show you here. If we go to our customers tab, we have our customer name, and we have our synonyms. So we can do cost name. We can just do customer. We do name of customer, customers, kind of add those in as our synonym. Now this ties back to our natural language querying. So if I was to double click here on our canvas, we get uh, just ask a question. So I can do count of customers it was a new one we just added right there. listen to the end users kind of the verbiage that they're using uh, just within the either meetings or just kind of their day-to-day -day. write those down and start thinking about how you can incorporate that into your data model here within the synonyms and this kind of comes back to well i don't i don't know that people will ever be able to kind of figure out these features it's their language you're using the things that they're giving you to enhance your data model q a this kind of goes back to consistency and consistency and consistency. So I always describe it as leave a breadcrumb trail so that anyone, when they land on your report, they kind of know where to begin, what features are available. Uh, within the buttons here at the top, I'm actually gonna go to Q and A on our home tab. This is a fun little feature. You actually don't have to use this button anymore. You can assign it from any button or visual, uh, but I'm actually gonna hold control and click. And this will pop up the Q and A dialog box within your report. If you add it, the end users will be curious. They will begin to click it. They'll begin to start typing out questions. So 
counts of customers. If you're able to teach them once on one report, that will kind of snowball to the next report and they will start asking for these features. So let's jump out of that. And we're going to do kind of within our page here now, I'm just gonna do a new page, uh, page two. And here within our visualizations uh, format, I don't have anything selected. So I'm gonna do page size type and we're actually gonna select Cortana. We now have a Cortana sized page. Why do I think that this is important? I think with the kind of integration of Alexa and Cortana and possibly even Siri at some point, <clears throat> whenever people are at, on their mobile devices or within their Windows 10 environment, they can start asking for these reports. So I'm actually gonna go down to type here to search. And I'm gonna do show rock and roll dashboard. There we go. Uh, so this will pop up an app. I think just with me being on a Windows 10 Insider build, you can't see kind of uh, the actual report being pulled up here within the Windows 10 environment, but it's actually pretty cool whenever you do. It'll pop up just a report this size with all the metrics, and then that does allow for natural language querying as well. All right, so with that, let's go and wrap up the hour here. I know we're running a little short on time. Closing remarks. I want you to start thinking about how you can deliver better than the ask. I know that nobody's coming to you and asking you to kind of clean up the field names. That's an extra mile that you're just not to go. Hopefully with the code, it makes your life a little bit easier. Once again, I'll leave that on GitHub. The Vertipack engine, kind of looking at the cardinality of your elements, I know that it might be a little bit more time in terms of your development and delivery, 100% worth it. We saw the time, or we saw the size difference of our model. Uh, it went from 96 megabytes down to 16, <clears throat> especially whenever you start getting into your resource consumption within the Power BI premium service, these type of elements are extremely important. You don't wanna be wasting uh, kind of the money in which you're spending just due to the inefficient model that's now been uploaded. Also, kind of to that effect, use DAX Studio to kind of start filming through your data model. I know we didn't explore it uh, fully here, but kind of that local host, if you can start looking at that, understanding that you are actually spinning up an analysis services cube within Power BI and how important or how almost mind-blowing that is uh, that they're giving that away for free. Read up on that, kind of understand a little bit more on the Tagore model how the compression engine works. Uh, once again, we had 88 million records, 16 megabytes, 8 million, 96, just from a simple splitting of our date and time series. And then uh, with your end users, just work with them. Start introducing some of these advanced analytics. Within a year, they're estimating 50% of queries will be natural language. Uh, kind of why I think that that is important is the, the better we kind of make our data culture within our organizations, kind of the cooler stuff that we can do as data modelers. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of leave it up to you guys. If you have any questions, suggestions, or if you just downright think that I'm crazy, uh, go ahead and leave some comments there for us. But other than that, I thank everyone here for their time. And if you'd like to connect with me online, feel free to do so at uh, Twitter, not about to sell on LinkedIn, just Alex M. Powers, or you can find me on Facebook with it's not about to sell. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Um, so far, there have been no questions either on, on Slack or uh, over here. Uh, but I, I think that is because your story was pretty clear. Don't mess up your data model. Think about yep. it. <laughs> yeah. are, are people using a Vertipack Analyzer currently within the chat? Um, nobody is saying anything about that. Maybe in the chat here. No. Nobody's saying anything about it. Um, I've used Vertipack Analyzer before, um, and it is useful. You can even connect it to your Power BI desktop model. Um, if you use, uh, what's the tool called again, a DAX editor, 
then you can actually find uh, where the an, uh, analysis services uh, server is being uh, opened on locally when you open Power BI Desktop. Yeah. Because as you know, Power BI Desktop is just uh, AS locally. Um, so if you use Docs Editor, you know the server address and port address. Oh, server address, you know. So you know the port to connect to. And that means you can connect the Virtupack Analyzer directly to your Power BI Desktop model if you have it opened up. So that's maybe something new for you then, I guess. Yeah, it's it's still mind blowing that you just have an analyst uh, analysis services just spun up on a Power BI desktop for free. Yeah, so I, I definitely encourage anyone to kind of read up a little bit about that. Any chance that they get. Yeah, um, Mehdi is saying uh, that they heard about it about the first pack analyzer, but haven't used it before. So I, I guess that's the case for most people. There's a lot of people out there that don't know these uh, uh, tools from the community. Tabular editor, Dux editor, um, whatever there is. What's Reza's tool called again? Um, Reza Red has an amazing tool as well. So, yeah, lots of stuff out there. People should be, oh, Power BI Helper. Oh, Rishi yeah. said that Power BI Helper is a, is a tool called. There lots of tool out, tools out there, and people barely use them that's what i noticed at least um even within uh, the company i work for people tend to just build a model and go with it and when it's slow they yeah you know what they blame just power bi <laughs> it's power bi <laughs> this other well, tool would never have had this problem yeah. so. I, I think the more you kind of use the tool the more you're going to understand what fields are going in in kind of your uh how expensive they might be kind of in the end. I mean, yeah. definitely, I, I don't think you should go back through every report you've ever built and put it through the analyzer and rebuild it. But just in, in practice going forward, just kind of make it a, make it a habit. Yeah. That's what I, recommend. I, uh, I got called out uh, by uh, Bertalan. I, I was saying Docs editor, but I, I don't, I don't know anything. It's called Docs studio. Oh, Docs studio. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, Deck Studio has any everything you want. It's amazing for writing decks as well uh, and analyzing your docs square docs queries. So yeah, cool, Alex. Thank you very much for doing this. Hopefully, I'll yeah. see you uh, next time and or uh, somewhere else in the future. So uh, great. with that, I wish you uh, a good uh, evening. I suppose it is there. Oh, it's morning. It's early. Oh, good morning, Dan. <laughs> good morning <laughs> to you, sir. And uh, have a nice day. Thank you, Jan. Enjoy the rest of your day, too. Thanks. Bye. Bye now.